Hello everyone and welcome to a very special vintage audio spotlight discussing what made Morant such a fabulous name in hi-fi and in, and in stereo through the 1970s. If you ask audiophiles today to name their top maybe three manufacturers of mass market, I'm not going to say, uh, you know, small market manufacturers that built custom products for people with a lot of money, but, but uh, shelf products that you could go into a hi-fi store or a high-end department store and uh, pay a significant amount of money and get a great product. Well, if you were to name some of the names, of course, Fisher Radio Corporation of New York, here we'll do detail in a future upload, uh, probably also the, uh, the uh, Sansui's would be right up there, uh, top of the line stuff. Maybe some people would argue some of the Pioneers, some of the uh, Kenwoods, but most everybody would agree that one name definitely belongs there, and that is the name Marantz. Now, Marantz is unusual in that it's one of the other, one of the two big manufacturers that was started in New York City approximately, oh, maybe the uh, same time. Avery Fisher began the Fisher Radio Corporation, uh, well, diddling and fiddling in the 1930s and 40s and started to go big time mainstream in the 50s. Well, Saul Morantz was uh, actually a contemporary of his, and although there's no record of the two ever having met, they were both, uh, they both came out of New York City. Uh, Saul lived in, Saul Morantz lived in uh, Kew Gardens, which is a part of Brooklyn, New York, whereas uh, Avery Fisher was, I believe, in New York City proper. Interestingly, though, they both came of, uh, were of Jewish heritage, and they both were classically trained musicians, and they both believed that what was on the market was insufficient for properly reproducing music that you could listen to. When Saul Morantz was born in 1911, of course, there was really no concept of uh, high fidelity or anything like that. And uh, he grew up a uh, normal life in New York City. And when he came, World War II came around, he did his time in the service. But when he got out of the service, he was a well-trained musician in one of his hobbies, as was Avery Fisher's hobby, was listening to uh, music, and particularly music on the radio and occasionally uh, records. Of course, records wars were raging in the 1940s. We, we often think back to the Sony Betamax wars of the 1980s and VHS versus Betamax and who would win. Well, the same thing was going on in the mid-1940s after World War II. Would the 45 continue to hold sway or would the long play, the LP album, hold sway? It was an interesting battle, but caught in the crosshairs of this battle were the producers of electronic equipment and listening equipment, in particular high fidelity equipment. And they were very frustrated because all of the different ref record manufacturers had different, had different ways that their records had what they call equalization curves. They had to, they had to go through a pre-amplification stage to get the sound the way that the, the record producers wanted them to be. And that consequently, there were a lot of different uh, high fidelity units. Some could play the RCA on a, on a proper pre-amp sort of setup. Some could play the Columbia Records and on and on and on, but very few could play all of the different records. Well, Saul Morantz was frustrated by this fact, and he set out to change it and do something about it, and the rest is... With the war is, over in Saul Morantz's home and uh, in his uh, house in Kew Gardens in Brooklyn, New York, he was so frustrated by what had occurred with the, uh, with the rapid proliferation of different styles of record and pre-production requirements needed for equalization and pre-amplifiers that he set out to design his own pre-amplifier, something that became known as the audio consulate. And interestingly enough, his first radio tinkerings were done by pulling the radio from his 1940 Mercury 
1940 Mercury car on the theory he said that he never listened to radio anyway in the car and he took it in his house and he made modifications to it to make it a standalone unit. But what he actually achieved in, in what he actually achieved in producing this audio console was a unit that could no matter what the record manufacturer was, you could tune your bass and treble for the proper equalization curve for the best listening experience. This was revolutionary. You know, this was a far this was far different than building one or two different settings in. He had the bass and treble with no less than like 48 different settings, the two combinations of bass and treble, so that his pre-amplifier could give perfect reproduction of the sounds that those records were producing. Well, he decided to, uh, when, when, a, when his friends discovered what he had built, they were so excited, they said, you know, you've got to start producing units. And in 1955, he really formally introduced the audio consulate. And here's a picture of that first item. It's a very rare Marantz. I don't have one myself. I'm looking for one. But they are more expensive because there weren't a lot of them made. And few of them survived. But when you look at the picture, pay particularly pay particular attention to the bass and treble adjusting knobs on there and you'll see all the various equalization settings that you could use to turn down the decibels of bass and add the decibels of treble it was an amazing unit and uh, before long he uh, he had the funds he worked with his mother and they produced a hundred of these units in the kitchen on the kitchen table so it was small change but people were loving what they heard take a look at the uh, take a look at this picture of the early 1955 Marantz audio consulate Pretty cool, eh? And I tell you, word spread very quickly and the orders came in. And it wasn't long before Saul Morant started work on the uh, model number two of the uh, pre-amplifier. And the orders rolled in and it reached a point where they had to move production. But he also needed to find somebody with a little touch of genius himself. And that person was called, named Sidney. Smith, who became the chief engineer for Morantz Corporation in the uh, in the late 1950s or perhaps the early, uh, very early 1960s when the stereo came into production. Now, they believed in making, Saul Morantz had one directive to make the very best audio equipment that would give the most faithful reproduction of audio sound and cost became a secondary consideration. This first uh, Model 1, the audio console, that sold for $150 in 1955 in order. That was a lot of money back then. And the Model 2 sold for about $200. But you know what? People bought it because there were audiophiles out there who demanded the very best audio reproduction. And they were tired of uh, having so much of the music left on the studio floor. They were willing to pay the money for that. Well, it wasn't long before the uh, stereo age came around in 1958 and 1959. And together with Sidney Smith, Saul Morantz developed an early stereo that was also very successful. And it went on to produce what they called the Model 10, which is a legendary collector item amongst the Morantz people. And what made the Model 10 particularly interesting was it had an oscilloscope <laughs> built into it. Yes! an oscilloscope and it's a highly collectible and very rare piece today but it, it really was the the beginning piece that gave way to what i call the eye candy of the late 1960s and into the 70s and 80s it led to all the craziness and all the dolls and knobs and gizmos and big silver faced receivers of that time it was probably born out of that model 10 with the oscilloscope very interesting but it's the kind of thing that captivated people's attention and besides giving them a listening experience it gave them a visual experience too 
to see this oscilloscope in action. They had no idea what the hell it was, but they liked to see it move. I think you'll agree that Model 10 was one really cool looking unit and that was the model that really got, uh, got Morantz into the broadcast stereo business. Uh, remember it was in his infancy in 1961, there was all these struggles, 1959, 60, 1961, to try to get stereo over the air. It was very easy to get it in records with the V grooves. It would have one channel, one channel on one side of the groove and one on the other side, and then just a double-sided needle would combine those two channels together for a stereo sound. But broadcast stereo was something that engineers struggled with for well over, well, almost two decades. But when it's finally solved by an engineer for Zenith Corporation and the FCC granted that as the standard for uh, stereo broadcast, FM stereo broadcast, Morantz was quick to capitalize on it with that really cool <laughs> Model 10. And if I could get my hands on one of those things, woo, <laughs> wouldn't I be happy with the uh, working oscilloscope? So the period is 1962, and by this time, Morantz had already moved their production for, from about uh, two years prior to Long Island, out there on Broadway on Long Island, and the, the site of what's a Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> today. Have we moved forward with a society or backwards? Well, the company did some experimentation in the 1960s. It wasn't really successful. And at one point, the company was uh, on the verge of bankruptcy because it tried to get into too many things at one time, phonographs and all, all types of diverse electronic equipment. And by the late 1960s, early 70s, they realized if we're going to survive, we have to get back to our roots. And in the mid-1960s, they sold themselves to Superscope Corporation and production moved to Japan. And with the Japanese production methods, that's when things really took off. The combination of Japanese production techniques and quality continuing, and also a little bit of Madison Avenue's finest advertising. Producing that Model 10B, the one that basically almost bankrupted Moran's Corporation and drove them into the arms of Superscope Corporation, was a unit that retailed for $750 in the 1960s, and that was a bit too much to chew off. And even at that price, with three years of development costs behind them, they were still losing money on every single one of the units. If Morantz's wife had not kicked in money to keep the company afloat, it would have disappeared from history at that time, and the glory age of Morantz would not even be known. But they finally, when Superscope took over and moved to production to Japan, they realized that gizmos, or eye candy, was also an important component of producing a great receiver. Don't get me wrong. One of the uh, hallmarks of moving production was that they were still bound and determined to use the best quality components that they could. That was not going to change, but they could do a lot to heighten the appeal, cool things like the oscilloscope. And uh, that was introduced in their Model 18 unit, which was really the gateway, the first solid state product that Morantz produced for the mass market. And it was also the model that had the gyro touch wheel. We all know that that had Morantz. You turn the wheel a little bit and the needle of the tuning dial only moves a tiny bit. You move it a lot and it moves along very slowly. You could very precisely tune in stations and it became one of the hallmarks of all of the uh, Morantz products that gyro flywheel construction on the side along with the signature blue of the Morantz uh, faceplate came in at that time the glass faceplate with the blue behind it 
the thing that's so captivating to collectors today when you switch on a unit and of course this is a rather this is a bit of an older unit and it needs to have the paper changed out because the paper turns to a yellowish and turns the color to a hellish green but it's still very cool looking well that's from the engineering side of things but here's what madison avenue new york advertising did See if you remember this very famous advertisement that came about in the 1970s for this poor guy who lived in an apartment building and his Moran stereo went up in the fire and worse than that the floors caved in, he was on the second floor, the third floor caved in, everything came down to the basement. Take a look at this ad and see if you remember this because this is one of the ads that launched Moran's as a legend in durability. Check it out. That's a pretty cool story how that Moran survived that. A lot of people saw that ad. And like I said, it was a tribute to the quality. But they also sell this ad by a British pub owner with the, uh, with the caption on top. These are built strong as a blooming tank. And a lot of people remember this ad too. Check it out. Because of those ads and the quality, and um, well, it had also been sold to uh, Philips, 50% holdings of uh, Superscope had been sold to Philips. A new engineer from, uh, had been headhunted from Pioneer Corporation, Ken Ishiwata. And he came to, the, he came to Morantz, he spent three months in Japan to learn the Morantz way of doing things. And he was able to really take Morantz to the pinnacle, to the pinnacle, the very peak of quality thing, particularly when it came to introducing new things like digital and new things like CDs. But of course, by the 1980s, the curtain was coming down on the golden age of stereos. And Morantz by that time had started to change colors to the gold faces, the champagne faces. And things started to, the drive became to make things cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and engineer cheaper costs and cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And before long, Morantz had lost its really stellar reputation as the, the leader of what they call the mass market the stereo uh, area. And basically the sun had set by that particular time. But leave no doubt about it, Morantz Corporation was really the signature star of the 19, well, 60s and 1970s, and right up until the early 1980s, and everyone aspired that I knew in college and in high school, everybody aspired to have a Morantz uh, unit. If you had a Morantz amplifier or a Morantz tuner, Wow, you were like a, you were like the kingpin of the hood when you had that. And of course, it was very captivating too in a dark room when you would switch it on and see that beautiful blue signature face that we see today. Take a look. I want to thank you for being along today and just a little exploration of what makes what makes and made Morant's products so great in the golden age of stereo. Of course, I could have taken you time to bring taken time to bring you down table side and tell you the various ways that were components were put on the board so the service man wouldn't have to worry about troubleshooting individual components but instead could just change out one board very economically saving in labor the beautiful way that they were internally designed but i think we'll save that for a future episode
we're, well, you're now looking at our next project on the bench, which will be the Baby Morantz, the Model 150. And I hope you join me then as we restore and uh, bring this back to its glory. Anyway, I want to thank you for being along and uh, listening in on the story of Morantz. And Saul Morantz is one of those fascinating <laughs> characters that makes America such an interesting uh, country because rather than accept things the way they are, people like Saul Morantz and Avery Fisher, they set out to not accept the status quo and to go beyond and to find a better way of doing things. And they were rewarded handsomely for their efforts. It wasn't always a smooth path to glory, but it sure was an interesting one. If you enjoyed this uh, little story today and our little overview, please hit the share button. Consider leaving a nice comment below. And of course, your thumbs up are most appreciated. I love bringing these audio vignettes to you. And I hope that you enjoy them. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm.